good morning. It's quite a beautiful morning because the uh, mist has uh, lifted and now it's uh, uh, sunny now. And uh, it's uh, a little bit like uh, after Zazen when the clouds lifted and you become more clear. So um, usually after Zazen, I feel as if uh, myself, I feel that, but also I feel that uh, I have gone to the bottom of the universe and then or back to the beginning of time. It is as if I went straight to the very beginning of time before all forms and shapes were created. So I do appreciate that sense, that kind of depth that goes with Zazen of the self, our self, dissolving, and the feeling of being renewed, created over and over again. I always feel uh, very refreshed after uh, sitting Zazen. I think that's one of the reasons why we continue to practice, returning to the beginning of time so that our being is renewed over and over again. It also makes me appreciate that I am alive, that I was born a human being, and that this life is transitory, impermanent, changing constantly. Really nothing to depend on nothing to hold on to. I also feel very grateful that I had stumbled onto the practice of Buddhism as my path. At first I had thought that it was because I was intelligent or insightful, but through the years I realized that it was instinctive and very urgent that I didn't realize. It was essential to my survival to overcome deep karmic conditions that were destructive, but at the time was not yet apparent. So at the very beginning, when I uh, started to sit and practice, I didn't uh, realize how urgent it was until later in the years, those destructive behavior in my family system began to appear later on. And then I realized that I was very, very lucky to have begun to uh, study because uh, many of my um, sisters and brothers, they were, they were really very destructive behavior, alcoholism, insanity. And I was about the only one that survived. So I, I think about that because if I didn't do Zazen, I might have been in that. And uh, not only that, but it's kind of interesting that um, talking about the uh, duality of, you, you know, like samsara or nirvana that, that uh, my uh, family later on, they, they appreciate, actually they understood what I was doing. That's also interesting to me because uh, I see my brother, I have a brother that's mentally ill and has been in hospitals for years and years and years. And um, uh, it also took me many years to um, find that space where I can appreciate my life and his life. That's different. And I don't have to feel guilty and responsible for that. And so therefore, we have a very good relationship. So that's very interesting, I think, for all of us to know that actually Zazen gives you that spaciousness and that kind of depth just through Zazen. Now, even though the teachings are there, but the Zazen itself gives you that kind of clarity. So, of course, uh, through the years, I was uh, humbled by this urgency, the necessity to practice Zen. And from the teachings, I learned about interdependency of the phenomenal world and realized that all sentient beings who had missed the opportunity to practice 
were black bodhisattvas, taking their places in samsara, sacrificing themselves so that I could be liberated through Zen practice. So I'm very grateful for my family, my parents, my sisters, and my brothers who chose to live in darkness. Of course, they didn't choose to live in darkness. They were just living in darkness. But they are their true bodhisattvas. I think that's a very good point. And all those beings chose to suffer so that we can be awakened. We should remember to really see and appreciate them in this way. So it goes for all people because uh, oftentimes when you uh, 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 practice, you know, you have a spiritual practice, there's a kind of a subtle arrogance, really, that you think that you, you are okay, but others are not. And even at best, we see that uh, they are uh, ignorant of their, of their uh, karmic condition. But it's funny, I don't see it that way, because I see that uh, it takes all people to take their positions in the world. We have taken this position exactly because other people took another position. So there's room for us, in other words. And they were willing to take, it's just like taking the bad seats and <laughs> we got the good seats <laughs> in the theater or something like that. But that's how I see it. So I really feel that they are um, unknowingly the bodhisattvas who are open and kind and giving because they were willing to sacrifice their lives so we can be awakened. Uh, maybe uh, some of you probably have already heard about the story about the dragon. I don't know why that came up. Probably it has to do with genuineness or truth or, you know. But anyway, in China, there was a man named Seiko. And he loved dragons. All his scrolls were of dragons. He designed his house like a dragon house. And he had many figures of dragons. So a real dragon thought, boy, if I go visit him at his house, he would be very, very happy. So one day, the dragon did go to visit him. <laughs> and he appeared in his house inside his room. And Seiko was shocked and so frightened of him that he almost drew his sword and killed him. The real dragon was also shocked at Seiko's dangerous response. And so he ran as fast as possible and escaped. But that's very interesting about um, the true dragon. You know how we like, <laughs> we, we usually play around with the, <laughs> the, the false dragon. Sometimes I think about it also like in practice too, you know, that uh, for example, if you're doing, um, if you're practicing, for example, just little things like you're practicing to attain a goal, that's sort of like a paper dragon. It's not, it's not the true dragon. True dragon is that you actually don't receive anything <laughs> when you're doing zazen, but it's a very profound statement about receiving nothing. Anyway, uh, so Suzuki Roshi used to say, true practice is very subtle and disarming. It's like walking through the mist in our robes, unaware of its effect. But when we look down at our sleeves, we are surprised that it is completely wet. Wet with the quiet absorption of Dharma that is genuine and true. Wet with the subtle truth of reality, the subtle but real dragon. So that's kind of interesting. Um, oftentimes I think of uh, weekend workshops where people uh, try to attain realization in a two-day two workshop. You think it's, it's not possible. But people make a lot of money doing that because they can promise you that and you believe it. You know? And of course you might attain something interesting, but 
as all of you must uh, know that sometimes when you do it, as quickly as it comes, in a couple of days it's gone too. So you may have had experience it, but you see, if it's subtle, it's small, it's consistent, and it's long. And also, it's, if you're doing the true sas, and it's really your own, you know. So around in the 60s, you know, Roshi and I uh, lived a couple of blocks from the Sokoji Temple. And that was before the San Francisco Zen Center was established. And every Wednesday evening, Suzuki Roshi would give a, a Dharma talk to around 60, 70 people there during that time. I already had three little children, and they were all sort of under four years old. I was also new to the practice, which means that I wasn't really sitting zazen regularly, but Roshi was sitting very regularly. He was sitting every morning, no matter what. But, but for me, I didn't. One was because I have children. Second was because I didn't, I didn't want to. <laughs> Why would you want to sit every morning? So it took a while for me to really get it. I like the uh, philosophy. I like Zen. You know, but uh, I don't know about the discipline, and I, I didn't recognize that I even need to meet a teacher. So anyway, when I was there, they were all sitting uh, zazen, and I felt the immovable calm, the openness in the zendo, everyone inseparable, looking forward to Suzuki Roshi's talk. It was not just Roshi's presence but the presence of everyone sitting zazen that created that powerful experience. And probably you're sitting here, you probably do not notice that you're creating that too. If somebody outside were to just walk in, they can feel it. But we're all in it, so we, we, we don't know. It's just that you can't, you can't see it. So anyway, I was struck by the absolute moment in which we all a part of the reality of being upright, immovable in this way. It was pretty profound. And Suzuki Roshi's ordinary presence was evident, it was humble, and it was courageous. Because he was just being himself, transparent with nothing hidden. I was completely touched by his talk. It was very intimate. But of course, when people asked me about what he talked about, I couldn't answer. I was so embarrassed. I couldn't even remember the content because it wasn't the words. Is it was a it was like a direct transmission of mind to mind. It has to be between Roshi and everyone in the room, not just me. And I'm sure that everyone felt it personally. He was the living example, standing there, trying to convey the spirit of Zen to us. But it was very subtle, it was very ordinary, and of course it was the real dragon. That's the thing. Anyway, I'll read a few paragraphs from his uh, Suzuki Roshi's uh, book, Not Always So. And it's kind of interesting, as I was reading it, I realized that I would like to read it again because I read it for so many years and then I picked out a few paragraphs here and there. But, but it's, quite, it's quite a book and they sell it at the store, Not Always So, Suzuki Roshi. And this chapter was on uh, direct experience of reality. When you study something with your whole mind and body, you will have direct experience. When you believe you have some problem, it means your practice is not good enough. When your practice is good enough, whatever you see, whatever you do, that is the direct experience. So when we study Buddhism, it is necessary to have strong conviction and to study not only with our mind, but also with our body. 
If you come to the lecture even though you are sleepy and unable to listen to it, your attending the lecture will bring you some experience of enlightenment. It will be enlightenment itself. Direct experience will come when you are completely one with your activity. When you have no idea of self, this could be when you are sitting, but it could also be whenever your way-seeking mind is strong enough to forget your selfish desires. Sometimes we may say that for Buddhists, there is nothing wrong because they always say, whatever you do, Buddha is doing it, not me, or Buddha is responsible and not me. But if you use that as an excuse, that is a misunderstanding. We say all beings have Buddha nature to encourage you to have an actual experience of it. The purpose of the statement is just to encourage your true practice, not to give you some excuse for your lazy practice or your practice that is merely formal. In other words, just doing it. You know? In China, people would carry something on their heads, perhaps honey, water in big jars. Sometimes someone must have dropped the jar. This is a big mistake, of course. But if you do not look back, it is all right. You just go on and on, even though there's no more honey or water on your head. You go on and on. That is not a mistake. But if you say, oh, I lost it, oh my, that is a mistake. That is not true practice. So that's a really um, Zen attitude about uh, not turning back. In fact, this reminds me of the uh, uh, Kese practice period theme by uh, Tendo Kaku. It was a verse of the praise. The quote, it says, Succeeding he swings the axe without injuring the nose. Failing, he drops the pitcher without looking back. And all alone, he sat frozen at Shaolin. So this is just part of that big phrase. But the point was, he dropped the pitcher and you do, do not look back. You, you just keep going and keep going. And oftentimes, we always reflect on what we just did. Instead of saying, it's gone, now we're into the new situation, the new moment. So we should always attend to the next moment, and the next moment, and the next moment. When you do something, have a strong determination to do it. Without any idea of skillful or not, dangerous or not, you just do it. When you do something with this kind of conviction, that is true practice. The strong conviction to realize your life is beyond successful or not successful. That's good. Beyond any fear, any feeling of fear, you just do it. That is real practice and that is the way-seeking mind which goes beyond the dualistic idea of good and bad, right or wrong. You just do it. When we chant the four vows, sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them exactly because it is impossible. We would try to do it. That's also very Zen. We don't do something because we think it's possible. We do something because we think it is impossible. So it makes you go beyond this idea of success or not success. Also, it makes your, um, what is it, your, uh, your goal or your vision bigger than yourself. Vision bigger than yourself. In fact, uh, usually when it's bigger than yourself, you can do it. When it's small and you, <laughs> you can't do it. Let's see, see if I could remember when, you yeah, know, for me it was kind of interesting, like when I used to do things for myself, you know, 
I used to be afraid, you know, just buying an item, a big car or something, I would be afraid. But when it comes to doing something for the Zen Center, then I can do it. Because, I mean, you know, like starting the Zen Center and establishing it, I mean, that's a, that's a big thing. But it is so big that it's beyond oneself. So you just do it. And you don't, and because uh, it's bigger than yourself, then it becomes more selfless, and you just take it day by day, moment by moment. So we help people just because we wish to, not because we think we will be successful. It is a trying, the trying, that is the point. All and incomparable teaching does not mean it is the best teaching. As Dogen Zenji says, we do not discuss the meaning of the teaching in a comparative way, but emphasize how, how to practice. We focus our study on how to accept the teaching and live, and actually how to live the teaching. Whether or not our teaching is profound or lofty misses the point. This is characteristic of Zen and characteristic of true Buddhism. Rather than setting up a system of Buddhism, we put emphasis on true practice. Also, I was thinking too, you know, like, like uh, uh, no, no, no belief system in the sense that... Um, Strictly speaking, in Buddhism, we don't, we don't really have a belief system. And that's why we say we believe, we believe in nothing, because we want to have our, our own profound nature uh, um, inform us, inform us what is true, what is real, what is valuable or not. And it's within ourselves that actually we can be informed very directly. You don't need a deity, you know, you know, to do it. We ourselves inherently has that uh, wisdom. There are many metaphors referring to particular attitudes of Zen. Many of us are brought up with the idea of teachings that are ready-made, that's another one too, <laughs> ready-made, well-formulated, like reaching into a refrigerator to get what you need. But Zen practitioners should be more interested in how to produce food from the field, from the source. Food doesn't come from the refrigerator or from Safeway, it comes from the ground up. Usually, we are not interested in the emptiness of the ground. We are more interested in something that is growing in the garden. That's also true, like what's growing out there. But not the bare soil itself. If you want to have a great harvest, the most important thing is to make the soil rich and to cultivate it. We are not interested in a special deity or something that was already there. We are interested in the bare, empty ground from which all things are created. And that is our zazen, returning to the empty field, cultivating it day by day. That's a good metaphor. But even in, um, in uh, Japanese cooking, you know, each ingredient is prepared carefully and separately, usually. But when it is in your stomach, it is all mixed up, just like the world of the Absolute. As long as the ingredients are separate, it has no nutritional value. That is like your intellectual understanding. It remains separate from your actual life. It's all categorized, labeled separate it, analyze, you know. But actually, in your actual life, everything is all kind of mixed, mixed up. So that's probably why it's so hard to 
see it, and as soon as you analyze it, that's not your real life that you're analyzing and formulating. Your real life can only be lived and experienced and informed directly as you're living it. So that is like your intellectual understanding it remains separate from your actual life. Zazen practice is mixing the various ways we have of understanding and letting it all work together. A kerosene lamp will not work just because it is filled with kerosene. It also needs air for combustion and also matches. With air, matches, kerosene, the lamp will work. That is our Zazen practice. To have a so-called enlightenment is, of course, important. We, um, but what is more important is to know how, always to know how, to adjust the flame in Zazen and in our everyday life. When the flame is in complete combustion, you don't smell the oil. When it is smoky, you will smell something. When your life is in complete combustion, you have no complaint and there is no need to be aware of your practice. In other words, the more you talk about your practice, it will be smoking and not clear. Again, the main point is to exhaust all your energies into living your life, no matter what the situation is from moment to moment, including negative situations disappointments. Include them all into your practice and mix everything up. And then, of course, you can't tell what is good and what is bad. Just live. Yeah, it is interesting because a lot of times we have these ideas of, oh, this was a, a good situation, that's a bad situation. Always turns out that the bad later on in years became good because if it weren't for that situation, it brought you to another situation a couple of years later. But at the moment, it certainly doesn't seem like it was a good situation. So that's, uh, of course, it reminds me of that, what is it, that story about the, the horse? I probably can't remember, not about the horse, but about this, this, this guy that um, he wanted to go somewhere or something, but then he broke his leg. So then he couldn't go to the army. You see, you see what I mean? Like that. But anyway, I can't remember all the story, but it was kind of like many events like that. Then here, here's a, a poem that I had heard many years ago when I began practicing Zen, and because it reflects a subtle way of living. Uh, it was by a Japanese poet, Basho, who lived in the 17th century. One day, his teacher came to him and said something like, What is your understanding? And Basho replied, The rain has passed and the green moss is wet. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> but then, of course, the teacher wasn't satisfied. He asked again, can't you say more than that? Then there was a pause. And then Basho suddenly heard a frog jumping into the pond. So immediately he said, frog jumps in the sound of water. Of course, it was splash, you know. Probably some of you have heard this. It's a very famous haiku. And that was his reply. But what is this sound? You know, this sound. When we are in one mind, there is no subject and no object. When we are in this one mind. So there's no frog, no basho, not even pond, only this sound. 
the sound of emptiness, the sound of our true being, before words, before form. And it is within this sound that we feel this aliveness, this spontaneity. See, it's in this sound. Of course, it goes back to your original nature, you know, this empty field, this empty field when we do zazen. Um, it is about that mind that is spacious and present and uh, responds to everything uh, immediately without any walls or a lot of times I think when we live our lives we don't we don't do that children do that quite a bit but we've kind of lost that you know whenever we see something it's beautiful we begin to name it you know we say oh that's the roses or that's the redwood tree but we don't just trust just the experience of course we want to share it that's why <laughs> So anyway, it was this simplicity, this directness in Zen, which attracted me to the practice, this spontaneity. There was something immediate, something pure and direct. Its continuous practice awakens us immediately from our delusions of duality, of being separate from within and without. We are conditioned to think that we are here and the world is out there. We are here and the world, we are here and the tree is out there. Uh, yeah, that's uh, We do not realize that our life is interdependently connected with everything. In fact, there's no such thing as my life and, then, and your life. It is truly only one life in which each of us must live out the uniqueness of our life as it is, as it simultaneously invoke all beings to do the same. So in the way that you live out your life um, wholeheartedly and truly, it actually invokes all things around you to also inherently do that. That's, uh, um, I guess that's what they mean when they say, uh, when you experience enlightenment, the whole world is enlightened. And of course, when you feel delusion, the whole world is in delusion. That's also, also true. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, I think we, kind of understand it from a um, analytical point of view, which is also true, you know. When, when you're not feeling good, you behave in such a way that it creates bad feelings around you. When you're not feeling good, you create that. But even in Zen, they do it even more in terms of essence. You know, it's even before that. That's the gross level of understanding that and receiving that teaching. But uh, in Zen, it's, it's pretty interesting because all the things that I've written, they always keep saying, you know, how, 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 uh, how the whole universe comes and helps you, you know? And actually, yeah, I think, yeah, in my experience, uh, it has. I could name so many situations which it has and I don't know why or what. I mean, even the fact that this, this uh, temple, Sonoma Mountain, appeared and came and we had no money. How could anybody buy this land, 82 acres? There's no way you could think you can do that. But it happened. <laughs> so it has to be from the universe. Has to be, to me. The universe helping it along because there was a kind of uh, selfless intention, you know, and uh, like I say, I don't think I could have done it. 
So our practice is to realize this interdependent connection that from the beginning everything is originally one. Dogen refers to this idea of practice enlightenment as inseparable. So even practice and enlightenment or delusion enlightenment is actually inseparable. Zazen is not a means to an end as many of us might think. The Zazen posture itself is the embodiment of enlightenment. So when we sit, just the posture itself is enlightenment. Oh uh, yeah, it seemed like when, when, when I first uh, heard that, I thought, oh, they're just trying to tell us to, tell us to <laughs> convince us to sit. You know, but then of course, after I start sitting for many, many years, then of course I know that when I'm sitting in this posture, it is the posture itself. Because at first it feels clumsy, you know. It's something that you're doing and, and someone told you to do it, you know. But then once I started to do it and begin to experience, you know, go into this being, um, and without a word, you know, uh, I begin to experience that it is uh, a complete experience of self. So we practice because we cannot help but manifest our enlightened self. Through zazen, we are able to receive what is already there. Not that we're going to find something different. It's already there. We do not have to look outside ourselves to find completion, to find fulfillment. We are the physical embodiment of creation. And all we have to do is have faith to be calm and still enough so that we can experience it. And of course, some people you know, different religions call it different names, call it God, call it Allah. But Zen focuses on the direct, authentic experience before we name it. So even for Zen, that's what we mean by, oh, when we say, when you meet the Buddha, kill it, or, or uh, we have to go beyond Zen. That's what we really mean, to go beyond Zen. So we are it, and we are the sound, in Basho's poem. We should throw ourselves into the life of the Buddha, to throw ourselves into living, and to throw our whole being into whatever we do, like an inner vow. When we vow to do something, we don't hold back. We throw our whole being into this life, this living moment. And by doing so, there is a continuous direction, sense of direction. Just like what we were saying, moving forward, don't look back, you know. That's kind of like a vow. Um, I think of the whole universe is also in a vow. You know, the sun always comes up and it always goes down doesn't miss it. It always does that. So it's, you know, the sun, it's a vow. The whole universe is uh, operating by vow. That's what I think now. So we shouldn't take vow as something outside ourselves. I think it's something natural if you look at the universe. And by doing, there is continuous direction. So in Zazen, when thoughts come up, you return to your breath and your quiet repose of your physical being. So you return to your breath and the quiet repose of your physical being. That's all. Gradually, the thoughts dissolve because you are not focused on them. As soon as you notice thoughts, 
it dissolves. But if you focus on them, then it grows and it grows and it grows and becomes a bramble, you know, like bushes of, 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 of uh, uh, problems and all kinds of things that goes on. And it's all up here, if you, th- yeah, right? It's all up here. Because actually when you're thinking about this moment, you're just sitting here, you know? <laughs> and where are the problems? Zazen can be a condensed situation of your life, a mini-universe, right here on your cushion. The way you are, the way you struggle during Zazen, is similar to the ways you are in your life. We are constantly challenged with pain in our legs, in our knees, in our backs, restlessness, emotions, endless thoughts. And zazen can be viewed as a laboratory of deep inquiry, investigation of self. What is unique is that you are both the investigator and the object of the investigation. So that's another unique point, too. There's a consciousness of this looking, and then there's this being that's being looked at. And no one needs to interpret the results. You will gradually know yourself quite intimately because of having witnessed your most intimate thoughts, feelings, reactions so many times and so clearly. And gradually you will be able to accept all aspects of yourself, appreciating just you as you are. The various marks of our karmic situation are the very marks of the Buddha. It's hard for us to believe that our limitations are treasures. It is through them that we can become transformed. And it is, of course, similar to composting, because if you didn't have the negative aspects, there's nothing to turn into rich soil. But the Bodhisattva way is compassionate and slow, bringing everything onto the path. We walk step by step like an elephant. We walk together with our pain, with our misery. We walk together with the messiness in our lives so that every aspect may be transformed. Life is difficult. Suzuki Roshi used to say this phrase, through and through. In other words, not transcend, but through. When we go through, we go with all the mess, all the difficulties. And families deal with that a lot, unpredictable mess. It is as if you have to bring your entire family, not just you alone, into relationships, children crying, cooking, dirty dishes, everything. As the late Trumpa Rinpoche used to say, He used to say that Buddhism is a domestic affair. It starts at the kitchen sink. And I like that very much. Um, So anyway, this gives texture to our realization. I think that's also true too. You know, we must carry all the baggage of humanity as we tread on this path. That's the spirit of compassion. And that's the birth of all the bodhisattvas. Anyway, that's my talk. I was about to, to remind everybody that the Raksu class is coming. And it's about stitching. It's about through. You know, it's about uh, working with all our difficulties. Because uh, just stitching the Raksu, you know, like this Raksu, is a kind of like a concrete example of the teachings that we do. Because even the, it, the there's a kind of stitching that uh, reflects the idea of taking the backward step, turning the radiance inward. It's in the stitches. It's quite something. And uh, enlightenment, delusion, enlightenment, delusion, it's all sewn together. Yeah, and also the, the, the front part is sort of like a, uh, little little uh, raindrops that start to dot, and we are all 
uh, supposed to sow. So th this part is sort of like the the uh, aim, the the aim of of perfection or enlightenment. And then the under part, the under part is the part that is our unique self because you can't see it and it goes, it's slanted and, and, and it's sort of like our unique self that we cannot help but sew it in that way and these two parts go together. So the Raksu is very, very profound and of course the Okesa, we finished sewing uh, three big Okesas that's for uh, ordination. And uh, I always like that because it really is true. Like here I'm giving a talk, but in, in Zen, they always emphasize doing. They always emphasize concrete examples, always emphasize living it rather than talking about it. Even understanding it, you don't need to understand it. You just have to live it. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. Amen. that um, talking about the uh, duality of, you, you know, like samsara or nirvana that, that uh, my uh, family later on, they, they appreciate, actually they understood what I was doing. That's also interesting to me because uh, I see my brother, I have a brother that's mentally ill and has been in hospitals for years and years and years. And um, uh, it also took me many years to um, find that space where I can appreciate my life and his life. That's different. And I don't have to feel guilty and responsible for that. And so therefore, we have a very good relationship. So that's very interesting, I think, for all of us to know that actually Sazen gives you that spaciousness and that kind of depth just through zazen. Now, even though the teachings are there, but the zazen itself gives you that kind of clarity. So, of course, uh, through the years, I was uh, humbled by this urgency, the necessity to practice zen. And before all forms and shapes were created, so I do appreciate that sense, that kind of depth that goes with Zazen, of the self, our self, dissolving, and the feeling of being renewed, created over and over again. I always feel uh, very refreshed after uh, sitting Zazen. I think that's one of the reasons why we continue to practice returning to the beginning of time so that our being is renewed over and over again. It also makes me appreciate that I am alive, that I was born a human being, and that this life is transitory, impermanent, changing constantly. Really nothing to depend on, nothing to hold on to. I also feel very grateful that I had stumbled onto the practice of Buddhism as my path. At first I had thought that it was because I was intelligent or insightful, but through the years I realized that it was instinctive and very urgent that I didn't realize. It was essential to my survival to overcome deep karmic conditions that were destructive, but at the time was not yet apparent. So at the very beginning, when I uh, started to sit and practice, I didn't uh, realize how urgent it was until later in the years, those destructive behavior in my family system began to appear later on. And then I realized that I was very, very lucky to have begun to uh, study because 
uh, many of my um, sisters and brothers, they were, they were really very destructive behavior, alcoholism, insanity, and I was about the only one that survived. So I, I think about that because if I didn't do Zazen, I might have been in that. And uh, not only that, but it's kind of interesting. From the teachings, I learned about interdependency of the phenomenal world and realized that all sentient beings who had missed the opportunity to practice were black bodhisattvas, taking their places in samsara, sacrificing themselves so that I could be liberated through Zen practice. So I'm very grateful for my family, my parents, my sisters, and my brothers who chose to live in darkness. Of course, they didn't choose to live in darkness. They were just living in darkness. But they are their true bodhisattvas. I think that's a very good point. And all those beings chose to suffer so that we can be awakened. We should remember to really see and appreciate them in this way. So it goes for all people because uh, oftentimes when you uh, 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 practice, you know, you have a spiritual practice, there's a kind of a subtle arrogance, really, that you think that you, you are okay, but others are not. Good morning. It's quite a beautiful morning because the uh, mist has uh, lifted and now it's uh, uh, sunny now. And uh, it's uh, a little bit like uh, after Zazen when the clouds lifted and you become more clear. So um, usually after zazen, I feel as if uh, myself, I feel that, but also I feel that uh, I have gone to the bottom of the universe and then or back to the beginning of time. It is as if I went straight to the very beginning of time.